When Cuphead came out in 2017, I decided I'd give it a try. I knew that it had a reputation for being really difficult, but I play lots of games, so I figured I'd still give it a whirl. I couldn't even get past the first boss, and after trying and failing for over a week to beat it, I finally gave up. I then asked my younger brother, who is excellent at fast-paced action video games, to try to play Cuphead. I still wanted to experience the game firsthand, so I figured I could watch him play instead. He made it much further than I did, but I could tell that eventually he lost interest in the game too. I asked him why, and he said that the game got too difficult too quickly. In his opinion, he wasn't given enough time to master new skills before the game presented him with challenges testing those skills. So we stopped playing, and that was the end of that. Obviously, some games, like Cuphead, are markedly more difficult than other games, like Stardew Valley. There's variation in hard games and easy games, and I think that this is a good thing, because it means that there is something out there for all kinds of players. However, regardless of whether you're making a hard game or an easy game, the level of relative challenge generally does increase the longer you play. This is called progression, and it is a universal characteristic of games as an artistic medium. They increase in difficulty over time, sometimes slowly, and sometimes quite rapidly, as was the case with Cuphead. So how do we ensure that we are designing progression fairly? If we don't increase the level of difficulty fast enough, players will get bored and stop playing. But if we increase the difficulty too fast, players will get overwhelmed and then still stop playing. While the particular details of designing progression will largely depend on the game that you're making, there are a few guiding concepts that we can use to help us implement fair and rewarding progression for players regardless of game genre. We can use the guiding concept of flow to help us craft engaging rather than punishing progression for players. This concept comes from the Hungarian psychologist Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote extensively about it over his lifetime. Csikszentmihalyi describes flow as, the sense of effortless action people feel in moments that stand out as the best in their lives. Athletes refer to it as being in the zone religious mystics as being in ecstasy, artists and musicians as aesthetic rapture. Athletes, mystics, and artists do very different things when they reach flow, yet their descriptions of the experience are remarkably similar. Csikszentmihalyi gives all kinds of examples of experiences that might induce a flow state in us, from skiing down a slope, to singing in a choir, programming a computer, closing an important business deal, or simply just talking to your friends. The common denominator between all of these experiences is how they make people feel. It's when what you feel, think, and wish are all in harmony. Being in a flow state is a beautiful experience. Your self-consciousness disappears and you feel confident, and hours seem to pass by in minutes because you're enjoying yourself that much. Csikszentmihalyi refers to being in a flow state as an optimal experience that gives us flashes of intense living against the dull background of ordinary life. While Csikszentmihalyi's work was never exclusively about games, his theories have been adopted by many game designers and game studies scholars. And for good reason, well-designed games often induce a flow state in players. Csikszentmihalyi himself considers games as flow activities, because games are more likely to create a flow state in people than other types of activities. Why? According to Csikszentmihalyi, there are three main elements required to create a flow state. Goals, feedback, and challenge. All three of these things are core elements of games, which is why they're so adept at creating flow states. Let's explore each of these three elements in detail, starting with goals. 
In order to create a sense of flow, people need to be able to focus on straightforward goals. Csikszentmihalyi writes that, Flow tends to occur when a person faces a clear set of goals that require appropriate responses. It is easy to enter flow in games such as chess, tennis, or poker, because they have goals and rules for action that make it possible for the player to act without questioning what should be done and how. For the duration of the game, the player lives in a self-contained universe where everything is black and white. Game rules create distinct goals for players, and importantly for creating a flow state, these goals are mostly contained within the game itself. When I'm playing Pac-Man and trying to eat all the dots and avoid the ghosts, I am focused intently on these two goals. All the game is asking me to do is achieve two simple things. By contrast, my career goals as a game designer and a professor are not so contained. They require me to think about all kinds of smaller goals, a lot of which aren't entirely clear-cut. These broader life goals require a diffused attention rather than a focused one, which makes these goals feel a lot more overwhelming, and they certainly do not help induce a flow state. The second core element of creating a flow state is providing feedback. Csikszentmihalyi explains that flow activities provide immediate feedback. They make it clear how well you are doing. After each move of a game, you can tell whether you have improved your position or not. With each step, the climber knows that he has inched higher. After each bar of a song, you can hear whether the notes you sang matched the score. On the job or at home, we might go for long periods without a clue as to how we stand, while in flow, we can usually tell. It is necessary to provide people with immediate, relevant feedback in order to induce a flow state. Again, by their very nature as interactive experiences, games provide players with all kinds of feedback. This could be moment-to-moment -moment feedback, or it could be a big reward after overcoming a challenge. The last required element for a flow state is challenge, which is the most relevant for our discussion today about progression. Not just any challenge will encourage a flow state, though. The level of challenge needs to be perfectly matched to the person's skills. Flow tends to occur when a person's skills are fully involved in overcoming a challenge that is just about manageable. If challenges are too high, one gets frustrated, then worried, and eventually anxious. If challenges are too low relative to one's skills, one gets relaxed, then bored. If both challenges and skills are perceived to be low, one gets to feel apathetic. But when high challenges are matched with high skills, then the deep involvement that sets flow apart from ordinary life is likely to occur. This is extremely relevant to game design because players will have a negative experience if the game is too difficult and if the game is too easy based on their current level of skill. This also closely relates to our opening conversation about progression. At the beginning of a game, we teach players rules and we give them goals. As they continue to play, they slowly gain mastery over the mechanics and increase in their level of skill. The game system needs to respond by increasing the level of challenge so that we keep players in a flow state. Ideally, the player's skill and the level of challenge should scale in a linear fashion. Csikszentmihalyi gives the example of a person learning to play tennis. When the player begins, they're about here on the chart. They have a low level of skill, but their lessons probably aren't very difficult, so it's likely they might experience flow. However, as they continue with their lessons and their skill improves, those beginning lessons aren't going to challenge them anymore, and they're going to fall out of flow. They're going to land themselves about here on the chart, feeling pretty bored. By contrast, if their lessons are too hard, they might become overwhelmed, 
feeling intimidated by the new task, and feel anxious instead. However, if their teacher can pay attention to their level of skill and scale their lessons appropriately, they can stay within this flow channel and retain their flow state. One of the most useful things about flow as a concept is it helps us understand how players experience a game over time. We can identify how players experience a game match after match, round after round, or from the very beginning of a long game until the very end. This is useful for us to think about when we're designing progression in our games. I think the concept of flow as it relates to game design is best summed up by Salen and Zimmerman. The best games manage to scale their challenge to the player. Ideally, games are simple to learn, but difficult to master, providing an appropriate degree of challenge for beginners and advanced players alike. So now we have the theory. We want to induce a flow state in players because being in a flow state feels amazing. Flow activities require clear goals, immediate feedback, and challenges that scale with our skill level. Games, by their very nature, contain all three of these elements, or at least well-designed games do. But how do we scale challenges appropriately? A lot of it is going to come down to careful balance and playtesting, ensuring that players understand their goals, and providing immediate, relevant feedback to players. However, there is one key thing to remember when designing progression. After a certain point, you want to be very, very careful about adding in new mechanics. It can be tempting because adding in new rules or mechanics can bring novelty to your game and thus perhaps renewed interest in playing. But it also means that you're introducing a new type of challenge and a new skill for players to master. It is extremely unlikely that your game will benefit from introducing a new mechanic about 75% of the way through. Progression isn't about adding in new things. It's about deepening the elements that you've already established. This is because flow states result when the player's skill matches the challenge. You introduce the types of challenges that players will face as early on as possible, and then you maintain those same types of challenges until the very end of the game, giving players the opportunity to increase their skills over time. Here's how I usually approach this. I create a list of all the different challenges players will face from puzzles to combat to platforming to simply waiting for crops to grow. Then as I design levels, I make sure that whatever challenges the player encounters at the beginning of the game are still present at the end. Let's look at a couple of examples of progression done well. In level 1-1 of Overcooked, Players are introduced to a number of challenges. First, they must follow recipes to fulfill the orders of customers. This means grabbing the right ingredients, chopping them, and then cooking them. In this first level, all customers order the same meal, onion soup, which requires one ingredient chopped three times. Second, they must serve customers and wash the dirty dishes that come back. Third, they've got to make sure that the food doesn't burn. Fourth, they must navigate through environmental obstacles. This counter here in the middle creates a challenge because it prevents them from taking the shortest path across the kitchen. Finally, though you can't tell, players must communicate with one another. This is a couch co-op game, and it requires players to collaborate and communicate about the challenges they're facing so that they can effectively and efficiently get the orders out. These are the five main challenges players face in Overcooked. Rather than adding in new challenges, the game just develops each of these elements further. Let's jump ahead and look at a mid-game level to examine how these challenges have progressed in difficulty. Once again, players must follow recipes to fulfill orders for customers. Except this time, instead of having one recipe with one ingredient, we have four different ingredients that can be combined in different ways. Customers might order a steak or a chicken burrito. Same mechanic, just requiring more skill. Players still must serve customers, 
dirty dishes still appear, and the players still must ensure food doesn't burn. The environmental obstacles are markedly harder. First, there are narrower spaces players must navigate, which means that they're more likely to bump into each other if they don't communicate. Secondly, there are fireballs as an environmental obstacle, which requires players to pay more attention and be more skilled at navigating. Lastly, the walkable area changes as the levels progress. The increased difficulty in each of these other areas of challenge also increases the difficulty of communicating with other players. Notably, the types of challenges have stayed the same from level 1-1 to this level 5-2. The challenges have increased in difficulty, but no new mechanics have been presented to the player. Finally, here's a late game level. Once again, we see all of the same challenges, just progressively harder. Players must cook multiple different types of recipes, both soup and burgers in this case. In the early game level, it was just soup. In the mid-game level, it was just burritos. Dishes still pile up, players still need to serve customers, and food can still burn. In terms of environmental challenges, the play area has become increasingly smaller. Additionally, players themselves must control the movement of these different level areas. They must press a button to rotate these rooms. This increases the difficulty of player communication and environmental awareness. Over the course of the game, Overcooked's progression system does not introduce any new mechanics or types of challenges to players. The challenges that were present in level 1-1 are still being used in a late game level 6-4. Instead of adding in new features, players are given the chance to gradually improve their level of skill at overcoming each of these different types of challenges, which keeps them situated in a flow state. We can apply the lessons we've learned from Overcooked to all kinds of game genres. For example, to make an enemy harder, you can increase its health, increase the damage it deals, and increase its area of detection so it's harder for players to sneak by. You can make platforming more difficult by reducing the amount of space players have to work with, requiring an increased amount of precision and timing. In many cases, how progression works in your game is going to depend on your game's mechanics and narrative. For example, during the first half of Marvel's Spider-Man, combat is constrained to specific areas within the game world. Players engage in combat by either starting a mission or going to an area with crime. Otherwise, they're free to swing around Manhattan as they please. However, about three quarters of the way through the game, there's a prison break. Suddenly, the entire map is full of enemies. Players must avoid enemy fire at all times now, and not just when they choose to engage in combat. Once again, this isn't adding in any new mechanics or gameplay features. It's taking an already established challenge of combat and just increasing the amount of exposure players have to it. Crafting effective and elegant progression is an essential aspect of designing a good game. We can use the concept of flow to aid us in designing progression. Flow states are created when the level of challenge in a game is perfectly matched to a player's skill. Flow is a highly enjoyable state to be in, so we should try to design our games to induce flow experiences for players. While of course regular playtesting and finely tuned balance are both essential, one of the best ways of designing progression to encourage flow states is by maintaining the same types of challenges throughout the entire play experience. This means that our rules and mechanics must stay consistent so that players have a clear understanding of game goals and feedback. This empowers players to improve their level of skill over time to match the increasingly difficult challenges the game system presents to them, which encourages them to stay in a rewarding state of flow.